Thank you for tuning into Learning Never Stops by TutorOcean.com, a place to find a tutor of quality guaranteed. Today's guest is Chris Karpinski, someone who you really want to tutor your kid. He's a top student at McGill University. Also, he's a recipient of the Governor General Silver Medal Award from Carleton University. In this interview, we discover who he is, how he got so good at math, and how to establish the love of math and your kids. Sincerely, Cameron. You said you were working on some research stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I'm working in an area called geometric group theory. Geometric group theory is about studying these abstract objects called groups through a geometric lens. Intersected with something else called descriptive set theory, which has to do with analysis and set theory. I'm working on a problem that involves these kinds of groups called hyperbolic groups, which are groups that have negative curvature. If you, you think of them geometrically, things that look like a saddle, these are like objects which have a negative curvature defined in a suitable sense. And I'm, I'm working with those kinds of groups and some of their generalizations and um, how these groups sort of interact with boundary. Okay. For every hyperbolic group, you can associate an object called its boundary. I'm studying a particular way that the group interacts with its boundary. Yeah. So that's a crash course of what I'm doing. How did you get so good at math? As with many things in life, the answer here is practice. In high school, I would uh, participate in math contests and go to uh, enrichment classes for high school students at Carleton University. I was doing math on a daily basis. I was doing lots of problems, learning new stuff regularly. I've been doing that for several year years now. So, so I guess it accumulated up uh, to this point. My next question is, did you have a tutor or a mentor when you were growing up? I did have a, a mentor when I was taking enrichment courses in high school. His name was Dragos. He, I feel that he really helped me discover math and d discover my interest in math. And he encouraged me to pursue math. He taught one of the enrichment courses for um, high school students. Math is about algebra and geometry. He encouraged me to do math and he taught me a lot of valuable lessons. So do you think your success is because of your own volition or was it something that your parents like nudged you? in a certain direction? I think it was mostly my own volition. It was my own idea to pursue math and my own sort of interest. But my parents did a lot in encouraging this. They signed me up for these for enrichment courses. They signed me up for contests and did a lot to encourage me to pursue math. But originally it was my own idea and my own interest to, to pursue math and physics. Yeah. Chris is somebody who's known for getting pretty good grades, actually top of the class, getting the governor general's award last year. Do you aim for that level of performance or perfection? You could say, what's your motivation? Is it for the grades or if I'm working on an assignment for a class, I aim to get perfect on, on that assignment in, in general, in, in life, I always aim to do my best. My best may not be perfect. For example, it's impossible to be a perfect human being, but I, I, I try to be the best person that I can be. I aim to be my best, which may not be perfect, and then try to improve what is my best over time. In terms of my motivation, my motivation to do well and, and to work hard, it boils down to three things for me. One, interest. I'm passionate about math and I'm interested in it. It brings me pleasure to, to sort of learn more and more math. That's one point of motivation. Another thing is just to gain competence in my field and try to be useful. I try to learn math and I try to do well because I want to become a competent mathematician and to have a positive contribution to society. And then third motivation is sort of the hard work that, that my parents put in. My parents made a lot of sacrifices and you know, a, a lot of hard work over the years so that my sister and I could have a good life. And I would like to sort of show something for that, return something in, in favor so that their efforts don't go to waste. It wouldn't be fair to characterize your parents as pushing you, but they certainly inspired not. you. They definitely laid the conditions for success. I would say like they lay down a bunch of stuff that makes it easier for me and my sister to achieve success. That's right. Yep. Very good. I don't want to offend you, but was it easy to get great marks for you? It was not easy. No, I can't say that any math course I've taken has been easy. Some courses have been easier than others for sure. But for each course I've had to put in work for each course, I've struggled with something had to sort of scratch my head, wonder why something was true. For every course that, that I've taken, I've, even the easiest course, 
I've had to put in some effort into it and I had to sort of think about it and study for things. Nothing was easy and I've had to do no work. No, there, there's never something like that. That's true in general. You can't really have any success without putting in the work. It reminds me a bit of Einstein's quotes. He said, don't worry about your problems with math. I assure you, I've got greater ones. <laughs> How do you instill a love for math in kids? Dragos, your mentor, he helped in that regard. He did, How yeah. you inspire other kids to get that involved in mathematics? Yeah, I would say to try to present math a little bit differently, not uh, because oftentimes math is presented the way in school is dry and kids are often forced to do like a lot of computations that are a bit boring. I, I would say to try to present math in, in a little bit different way to sort of cast it as something that, that you can be creative in, like a collaborative effort and something that's present in all aspects of life. So maybe for kids, maybe try to show how math is present in baking or in sports or other things, try to sort of integrate that math in, into their life. Another thing for, for kids that are really interested in math to, to get them to love it even more is to give them somewhat like challenging problems, like contest problems or stuff like that. And for me, where Dragos came in, he gave kids in this math program challenging problems. And then he showed how you can use reason to solve these challenging contest level problems. And that it's like a, a detective process for me. That's kind of what dragged me in a little bit into this whole thing. Basically just to present math as something that's a creative detective game rather than something that's just like methodical or mechanical and dry. Yeah, that makes sense. And it seems that you went far beyond the bounds of the curriculum in your early years. Is that something that you recommend for kids to just go for it, go for the advanced challenging math, not just to do the homework? Yeah, for kids that are interested and that are capable, certainly I, I would suggest going beyond the curriculum. First, of course, you should master the curriculum level first. Only when you're comfortable with curriculum level and then you want something extra, then certainly go for it. Because the, the Ontario curriculum is certainly limited. If, if you look at the curriculum that was taught, let's say in Eastern Europe or something, modern day Europe, it was much more expensive than like the current Ontario curriculum. So certainly much more to learn the, and outside of the regular curriculum and kids that age are able to learn much more than the regular Ontario curriculum. On that topic, do you have any advice for parents who have got kids in, let's say middle school and they're struggling mm -hmm. with the Ontario curriculum or right. any standard of school and the kids mm -hmm. are struggling and there is a sentiment of like, uh, I'm not good at math, that kind of thing. Do you have any advice for those parents? First of all, I would suggest to sort of sit down with a student and try to understand exactly what's the core cause of students struggling. It could be something in, in their lifestyle or, or routine that has to be changed. Maybe hanging out with the wrong group of friends that are negatively impacting their views towards math, negatively impacting their school performance. So just sit down with them and try to identify possible causes to why they're struggling and then try to eliminate that. And then uh, plan sort of a regular study schedule where you can sit down with your child and try to go through their homework and then to try to sort of build up their confidence with the material. For example, you could also watch some math videos on YouTube with your child on subjects that they're struggling with. Try to do things that build their confidence and reduce their fear of math. Focus on those points, on those particular things that they're struggling with. I would also suggest in, in conjunction with those two too, perhaps get a tutor as well. A tutor could certainly help with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is that just to make it fun, right? To, yeah, to for sure. Let, let go of the pressure, mm. the negativity, saying I'm bad at it and, and so on. Just to have fun with it, start with, start where you are and just go for it. So <laughs> that's what you're saying. Yeah. Moving on. I mean, are there any like particular study habits that like somebody could, let's say, copy or swipe from you to get more success in their school? So in terms of study habits, I think it depends on the individual. First of all, people have mm. different study styles and there's not one study sort of habit or study method that works for everyone, but a couple of methods were useful to me were writing things down. After my lectures, I would go through my notes and then write down sort of a brief summary, in my own words. A summary can be as short as writing down three main points, go through your notes, and then you try to identify are three key things from this lecture. And then you write those down and then you elaborate on those in a little bit more detail. That's something that I found helped me a lot just to write things out in your own words 
try to keep a, a log of those kind of condensed summary notes. That's one thing. Another thing is repetition. So regularly reviewing things. I, I sort of think of an analogy in terms of a paint roller. If you have a bad paint roller and then you're trying to paint a wall, it, it doesn't cover everything uniformly. There are a bunch of gaps. But then if you go through it again, it covers it a little bit better, but maybe there are still some gaps. And as you go up and down a bunch of times, it gets, you get a uniform layer, how it felt sometimes to review my notes. Sometimes when I'm studying for an exam or something, I'll review my notes. And then I feel like there's still a bunch of gaps that are missing. Okay, so I go through it again. There are less gaps, but still some gaps that are missing. And then I just keep going through it until there are no gaps. So I think that's uh, re repetition and doing that repetition together with your short summary notes. Love that. Yeah. And then a third thing is also get a study part because uh, as one of my professors used to say, the best way to learn a, a subject is to teach it to somebody else. So if you can find a study partner and that you can sort of teach things to each other, the content of the class to each other, that can also be tremendously helpful to learn the material and to study. Those are some habits that I think are useful. And that ties in nicely with, you know, getting away from the negativity and to the positivity, like finding friends who yeah. are super friends in a way, if it's not too cheesy to say, super mm -hmm. friends, somebody who you can use as a sounding board to explain concepts to someone to study with. Absolutely. That's great. I have some fun questions. Sure. If you could do anything without failure, like if you were, I know you're smart, but imagine 10 times smarter, or if you could not fail at anything, like what would you do? Well, I mean, I, I would probably just continue with my current mathematics. If, if you can be a mathematician who never fails, then I guess you'd pretty much be the, the best math who ever existed. To some extent, it's, it's not a really realistic question because it's like a, a superpower. If I could never fail, I guess then I would, I would do mathematics without failure. That's right. So you would unify theories in physics or? I guess so. Yeah. I would probably focus on mathematics because that's, that's sort of been my, my main interest. Yeah. Hmm. I suppose uh, physics, like the, the coming up with this grand unified theory of physics might, might be more useful to society a, a, as a whole. Yeah. But I would probably s still stick with math. And what are your interests like specifically in math? My interest in math center around algebra and geometry and their interaction. So I work with these objects called groups, which are algebraic objects in the sense that you have some algebraic operation where, where you can sort of take two things in the group and you can, in a sense, multiply them together to get something else. That's called an algebraic object. It's a group. And I'm interested in studying this through a geometric lens. So it turns out that groups, in contrast with many other objects, they have a really neat, strong geometric description that isn't really present with other objects. And so I study these objects groups through this geometric lens. Okay. But my work sort of, it's, it's sort of an interplay between the algebraic aspects of groups and their geometric and sort of combinatorial aspects. Okay. So it's going between those two and seeing how each one complements the other, how both of those tell you interesting results, groups, about these structures that you're studying. In physics, I'm interested mainly in like astrophysics, that's my favorite branch. My, my sort of first exposure into science was into actually astronomy. I remember around like summer 2010, I, 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 I watched this documentary from the History Channel about space, and I was absolutely captivated by it. I thought this is like the coolest thing ever. And so s since then, I would say astronomy has been my favorite branch of physics. Yeah. What was it about the documentary that captured your attention and interest is the existence of this whole other universe that's that's outside of ours what i mean by that is that we go about our day-to-day -day lives here on earth and then we don't really think about what's happening in the stars but there's so much that's happening even just just in our solar system one thing in that documentary was they went to different planets in our solar system and then told the story of each planet for a regular person here on earth you don't really see that but we're just focused with our own lives just going day in day out but so much rich structure out there in the universe waiting to be discovered. To me, that's something that really opened my eyes. It got me interested in, into science. So you had to learn the language of the universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and th 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 that's what led me to mathematics. Actually, I was originally mm -hmm. interested in physics. And then I realized to do, to be any good at physics, I have to learn some math. And then eventually the math took over and uh, that's where I am today. Are there any common myths about mathematicians or math in general? Yeah, certainly. One common myth is that mathematicians are an isolated breed of people. They have this kind of 
a stereotypical image of a mathematician just sitting at their desk, isolated from everyone and working on their own stuff. Nobody knows what they're doing. That couldn't be further from the truth, for, from my experience, at least. Mathematics is a very collaborative field. There's a lot of emphasis on communication. Mathematicians work on stuff and they often communicate their ideas to others in things like conferences, or they work on things jointly. You might have 10 people working on the same thing. They sort of publish their work and other people look at it and then ask questions and then connect with them. So math is really this, doing work in mathematics is a big network where Many people are connected and they share ideas, they share methods, they work together. It's very far from grinding away their own stuff, just isolated. There are, of course, mathematicians like that, that are just isolated, but it's quite rare from my experience to see that mathematics is really a collaborative field where communication is essential. I was going to say another myth about mathematics is that mathematics mm -hmm. is really about numbers. That's not true in general. So most of mathematics d does not have to do with numbers. A better way to describe mathematics, I would say, is the study of abstract structures. Because a lot of the things that you do in math is you define abstract structures, like groups, for example, which I study. And then you're interested in sort of discovering some of their properties and how they interact with other structures. You can think about mathematics as a universe of abstract structures and how each of them sort of interacts with each other and properties of these structures. It has very little to do with numbers. Of course, there are areas of mathematics that do involve numbers, but these are, this is just a small part of mathematics. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's so true. It's not just about being a numbers person or a word yeah, person. Exactly. Yeah. It's how much creativity, how much can you imagine like in your mind? Yeah. I would level, like how much abstraction can you handle before you lose your mind? <laughs> That's true. But no, it's, it's true that it's not isolated. It's not working in isolation. It's yeah. collaborating. Absolutely. People are not, what's funny is that it sounds like it's not competitive at that level because people are exchanging ideas. Is that fair? There, there is still competition to, to some level. You can also have competition between sort of different groups of people. So you might have one sort of group of people that's sort of working on a result. And then you have another group of people that are working on something in, independently and then mm -hmm. compete to, to see who can get the best results first. There definitely still is a competition in mathematics, but I would say sort of collaboration forms a larger part than, than just sort of competition. Have you had any unexpected outcomes from your recent adventures in math? Last fall, I did have an unexpected outcome on the project that I'm working on for my master's. There is one sort of object that I was working with. Base case is this object turned out to be finite. And I was working on a bit of a more general case. And my supervisor and I expected this to be infinite. There was no reason to believe initially that this object was actually finite. We were expecting it to be infinite. And then we were trying to incorporate the infiniteness of this object. We were basically assuming that it's going to be infinite. But it turned out that quite surprisingly that this object was actually finite. My successful venture w w w was that I was able to sort of generalize this previous result about this finite object. We thought that it was going to be, that this generalization would be infinite, but it was actually finite. And then that, that really surprised us. And so that simplified a lot of things that this object was actually finite and made everything work out much nicer than we imagined. That was something that very surprising and, and quite nice. It was very simple and it worked out. What's the biggest challenge that you're facing right now in your research, Chris? The challenge is to sort of generalize this further. As I just discussed, I generalized sort of one aspect of this starting case to one thing, but now I'm trying to generalize it to an even larger case. And that even larger case, I've been working on it for a couple of months and I'm basically stuck on, that's the biggest challenge that, that I'm facing right now is generalizing it to this even larger case. But how am I trying to overcome that challenge? I'm trying to throw different ideas at it, basically try to think of whatever I can, try to see if I can make any progress. Also looking at different papers that I can find online and seeing, is there anything useful that I can apply to this and make any progress? And also having regular meetings with my supervisor to kind of bounce ideas back and forth and to try to get some progress to try to move things forward. It is moving forward incrementally, still a lot of work to do and a lot of things to be discovered. Yes. So back to the collaboration, you need a helping hand. Maybe Absolutely. To give yeah. you a novel idea. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My supervisor has been tremendously helpful and I don't think I would be able to solve this completely on my own. Yeah. So definitely collaboration is quite useful in this case for me. And your supervisor. Does he supervise you individually or within a group? 
individually. I'm the only student that's working, I'm the only of his students that's working on geometric group theory. He has a bunch of other students, but they work on different things like combinatorics and something called descriptive set theory and stuff like that. So I'm the only student that's working on geometric group theory. Tutoring you in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great description. Yeah. And uh, speaking of tutors, you've, you've been approved to be a tutor on Tutor Ocean. So yeah, I have. Yeah. I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to join Tutor Ocean. So if there's some students out there who want to get tutored by you, how would they do that? They will find you on the website, tutorocean.com. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you search up my name, Chris Karpinski, you can find my profile. If you're interested, we can get in touch through Tutor Ocean and I would be happy to, to meet you and to work with you. What subjects do you specialize in teaching, Chris? I'll be teaching mathematics at the, from the middle school level up to undergraduate level, all subjects of mathematics, algebra, pre-algebra, calculus, pre-calculus, physics at the high school level, potentially also at the undergraduate level, if there's demand. Why do you enjoy tutoring, Chris? For a couple of reasons. First of all, tutoring someone, helping them quite a bit. If someone needs tutoring, then they're obviously struggling with the subject and, uh, it's always nice to help somebody in a moment that they're struggling. I think every human feels joy in helping another human with something that they're struggling with. When you tutor someone, you're helping them in that regard that brings joy. It's not only helping somebody with something that they're struggling with, doing something that, that I like, which is mathematics. I'm always happy to talk about mathematics or physics with anybody. If, if, if I can help somebody, but about mathematics or physics, then that's also an extra plus for me. Yeah. So it's that, but those two things of just helping them and then also helping them through mathematics and physics, which are my passions. That's great. There's certainly a lot of people looking for math help these days. Yeah. I guess. I wonder, why do you think that kids struggle with math as opposed to any other subject? It ultimately boils down to the, our evolutionary upbringing because human beings are not really sort of hardwired to do math. Same with physics, same with other sciences. Evolutionarily, we're not programmed to do mathematics and physics. And so it feels oftentimes so unnatural and so alien to us. That's the fundamental reason why a lot of people struggle so much with math and science. Struggles can be overcome by hard work and, and perseverance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to quote Mary Poppins, to find the element of fun. Yes, of course. Yeah. Great. So if there are any parents listening, you can certainly find help with, for your kids through an excellent tutor of quality like Chris Karpinski. So thank you very much for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Every it was a pleasure. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Take care now. Take care. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Learning Never Stops by TutorOcean.com, a place to find a tutor of quality guaranteed. Subscribe to the show on your Apple Podcasts app. It will help us get the show going. Have a great day. Over and out.